Welcome those who are already here. Um, we're just going to give it a few more minutes to um, let people in and we'll get our program started shortly. So I just want to again want to welcome people. I know that it's the holidays. There's a lot going on. Hopefully people have had time to rest, uh, spend time with their families. I wish uh, everyone the best health um, over these trying times and um, appreciate people's time coming to spend time with with people uh, talking about the thing confronting us right now in terms of reopening schools. I really appreciate all the hard work that people are doing. I know a lot of parents as a parent myself, remote learning has certainly been a challenge. Um, and it's an important conversation to talk about how to have education continue in these conditions in a way that is safe, that is equitable, that uh, meets the needs of our students and protects the health of our communities because it's very important. So I really appreciate people participating in this conversation, um, sharing their Wednesday night with us. And we will get the program started in a few minutes. Just a couple of housekeeping things as people are, are joining the call, joining the conversation. You should have a ability to ask questions into the Q&A. Uh, I believe on most applications for Zoom, you can hit the Q&A section, you click on that. Um, don't use the chat function. I don't, I don't think that's working for this, but we do wanna use the Q&A. The purpose of this is a conversation. We're certainly gonna be hearing from people. Um, we're gonna be hearing from CTU officers. We're gonna be hearing from uh, CTU nurses, nurses who work in CPS. Um, but we also do wanna hear the concerns of the community. We wanna hear what parents are thinking about, what they're um, worried about, the things that they wanna discuss. And that's what we wanna accomplish is an interaction between those um, between those people. So feel free to put anything and everything into the Q&A. Uh, there will be people who will answer those questions on the Q&A and some questions will also be kicked up to the panelists to, to take up. The panelists will be including nurses who work in the Chicago Public Schools. And we also have uh, some of our officers here from the Chicago Teachers Union, which is which should be great. Again, this, uh, this forum, I wanna welcome everybody to this forum. It's for um, the communities of our schools, parents, educators, people in the community to hear the concerns of, of nurses. Uh, and also some, uh, we'll also be hearing from our CTU officers as well. There will be live questions that people can answer. We will have Spanish interpretation. So if people could, when they are, asking their question or making their statements that they could speak uh, slowly and clearly so that the people who are doing the Spanish um, interpreters, the Spanish interpretation are able to, to keep up with that. Um, again, I wanna welcome people. I see that the Q and A has already been, uh, already been going, so that's, that's good. Maria, in Espanol, I'm part of the Yo no hablo mucho español, lo siento. <laughs> este, podemos decir que hay interpretación a español. Pueden, pueden ver en la parte de abajo un globo o un, un mapa y por eso hay los controles de interpretación. Muy bien, Nate, muy bien. <laughs> Gracias. All right, so it's coming up on 504. We'll give it um, one more minute. Again, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Dennis uh, Kosuth. I am a school nurse in Chicago Public Schools. I work at schools up in the uh, Rogers Park neighborhood. I have three schools that, that I'm assigned to this year. I know that um, we did win some things in our last contract, uh, particularly around nursing. We, there is an agreement to hire more nurses. And I even remember the first day after coming back to work from our strike last October, one of my coworkers asked me, oh, you're gonna be here every day. And, and I wish that were the case. So we were, there's progress on that. I know that was one of the questions in the chat. Is there a nurse in every school every day? 
um, we're making progress on that. And I think one thing worth remembering is that was the CTU that organized to make that happen. Um, you know, CTU believes firmly in health, believes firmly in bringing healthcare into our schools and health professionals into our schools. And that was a big reason why that was a central, one of the central demands of our fight last, last October. Um, so I see that it's 505. Again, I wanna welcome people. Um, thank you for spending your Wednesday night here to be part of this conversation. Uh, I wanna remind people that they can type their questions into the Q&A. Uh, that question will be answered by screeners as best they can. Some of those questions will be kicked up live to the panelists. There is Spanish interpretation so that if you have um, uh, need for that, that should be available. Um, and and, and let's get started. Uh, the reason we wanted to have this forum, I think is because there's a lot of questions. And I do know that as a nurse, I've been a nurse for, for over 13 years. Nurses very often, we, we dig in. If there's work to do, we, we jump in with both feet, um, regardless of the circumstances. You know, at one point in time, I've had six schools that I was responsible for. And I did the best that I could with that, with that caseload. Even working in hospitals, sometimes when I worked in the ER, I would have eight or nine patients and I would just jump in and do the best we can. And nurses, by and large, that's kind of our mentality. There's, there's work to be done. We jump in with both feet and do the work. But when you start hearing nurses speak up and speak out, I think it's worth listening to them because we don't do that lightly. We want to, the best for our patients. We are mandated as our license outlines to be advocates for our patients. And so that's why I thought this would be an important discussion for us to bring forward um, about what do healthcare providers, what do nurses think about the safety of this reopening. Coronavirus has had a terrible impact on our communities. My own uncle, my, my father's older brother right now is in Texas on a ventilator and he's fighting for his life. And I, and I hope the best for him, but I know that this virus has, has affected all of us, has affected us all deeply and we take this seriously. I've also lost two coworkers. I work part-time in a hospital in addition to my job in the schools and two of my coworkers who just li literally retired and then a couple of years ago and then both died from, from coronavirus. This is a serious disease. We take this very seriously. And that's why we wanted to have this conversation because if we're gonna open schools, we have to do it with those things in mind. So I'm gonna start off our, our, our conversation with a poll question. And then I'm gonna let the officers uh, who are present uh, address, address the, uh, the, the, the webinar. Um, the first poll question should be going up shortly. And it's, um, who are you? Where are you coming from to this, to this space? And we appreciate your, your time and your um, participation. Um, it's gonna ask you if you're a CTU member, if you're a parent, if you're both, uh, like myself, I have a, a seventh grader in Chicago Public Schools, um, or are you a community ally? So that poll should be coming up and you'll be able to participate in that so we can get an idea of, of who's, who's participating in this, in this webinar. And so I'm gonna go ahead um, to the officers and allow them to, um, to, to, to say something to, to participate in this webinar. Uh, I'm not sure, are we starting with, with Jesse, is that right? Or Yeah, I'll, I'll start, thanks, okay. thanks Dennis. Uh, and thanks to everyone who's on the call, both our, um, our members here, our nurses, um, uh, and CTU staff, but also all the people who are on the call. We've got about uh, 300 participants at this point. So uh, again, I also, uh, I appreciate your time. Um, I'm joined today by fellow CTU officers, uh, Vice President Stacey Davis Gates, and our financial secretary, Maria Moreno. Um, our recording secretary, Crystal Williams Hayes, is unavailable. Um, I, I'll just say a couple of things really briefly, which is that um, as a public school parent myself um, and as a teacher on leave, um, uh, we really do want to get back to school. Uh, in, uh, remote, remote education is difficult. It's produced all kinds of challenges. Um, that could be a whole meeting in and of itself. Um, the, the key thing for us, though, is that that has to be done in a way that's safe, um, in a way that uh, is equitable, and in a way that we can trust. Um, by safety, we mean we shouldn't be opening schools from transmission levels in our city overall and in the neighborhoods um, is at extremely high levels. Um, we think that just means there's too much virus coming into the, into the schools, into our buildings. 
Um, in addition to that, there are a number of other um, sort of practical considerations we have about being able to maintain social distancing, having effective use of masks, and other issues along those lines. Um, we certainly could get into those, uh, some of those safety questions um, that we have a lot of expertise in this call. Um, second issue we'd say is about equity. Um, we talk about, you know, the, it's the it's the uh, Black and Latinx working class neighborhoods in Chicago that have been hit the hardest by this virus. Um, you know, we're talking about places where people work service sector jobs, where there's crowded multi-generational housing, where people have the least access to health care to begin with. Um, and so COVID-19 is devastating people uh, in those neighborhoods. And that's where our students are mainly from. And so while I, you know, I think there's, um, there's some people in the city, if you're middle class, if you have a, a, you know, a spacious place to live, if your neighborhood has only three or 4% positivity, um, saying, well, what's the big deal? My, our kids should be back. Um, but it looks very different if you uh, live on the west side of the city or the southwest side of the city and everyone you know is getting this disease and many people are dying of it. Um, and like I said, that, that's why so many of our parents voted with our feet and said we're not coming back in person. Um, Two thirds of CPS parents um, uh, basically took a pass on coming back. And there's a bunch of equity issues involved in that as well, which is that why are we slashing the amount of time and educational attention that those students get, the ones that are staying remote, in order to, um, in order to deliver in school for a fairly small minority of students. So we're concerned about equity. And finally, we have to, have to trust whatever CPS does. Um, there is a sad track record in, in, in the Chicago Public Schools of over-promising and under-delivering. Um, you know, so for example, CPS um, privatized custodial services, promising the schools would be cleaner than ever. Uh, they were in fact filthy and um, failed, ins you know, failed inspections to, uh, to a massive extent. And, um, and so we, we need to know that like not only um, are the CPS making promises about ventilation and other safety matters, but actually that we have some ability to make sure that their promises are really being kept. So th those, are, those are our concerns. We don't think those are unreasonable concerns. And unfortunately, the Board of Education simply isn't bargaining with us in good faith about those, uh, those matters. Um, they're telling us we're gonna have to go back in. They're not gonna talk about health metrics. Um, they haven't given us what we um, are demanding in a whole number of areas. And we have 7,000 staff getting ready to go back into the buildings on January 4th. Um, so um, that's the reason why we're here tonight, make, you know, continuing to make our case. We think we have a reasonable case. Uh, we, want, um, we want people to know that you know, we, we're perfectly willing to go back to school, but it needs to be safe, it needs to be equitable, and it needs to be a process that we can trust. Uh, and when we have that, we think that'll be the best outcome for everyone involved in public education. So let me stop with that um, and see if maybe Stacy wants to pick up the ball. Thank you, Jesse, and hello to everyone on the webinar. Um, we appreciate you being here. Um, I'm sure you have, you know, more questions than CPS has answered, um, because many of those questions should be directed at the Chicago Public Schools and the Mayor of Chicago, because this is their plan. Um, so please don't be dismayed at the fact that many of us cannot be accountable um, to those answers, because we simply do not know um, how they intend to implement a reopening plan that prioritizes safety um, and, you know, puts all five mitigators in play at every school at the same time, um, all the time. And I say that um, without any glee. Um, I have three children who attend the Chicago Public Schools, and um, I am experiencing, with most families are experiencing, um, the element of having cabin fever, the element of being worried that your um, children are missing out on something, but also the weight of a pandemic that has um, sickened um, close family members, um, that has killed um, friends of mine. And it is not a good feeling to have to fight for safety, to have to fight for reasonableness. Our school communities are populated with children and adults. And, and I think we need to say that. Because when I hear people say that children um, can't catch it, which I know that's not true, but you know these arguments rest on children. And I've never been in a school community that doesn't include adults. And then on the top of that, our children will leave school communities and go home to a household 
that also includes grownups. Um, and so we have to understand that children are not islands um, where they exist onto themselves, but that they are a part of a larger community of a myriad of people, um, many with um, comorbidities um, that need to be considered in this as well. But I'm not the nurse and I'm gonna let the nurses have that discussion. But what I will say very clearly, this plan has been sold to us as a plan of equity. And the facts tell us something very different. The facts are this, black families, brown families, who are, um, who are the largest majority of the students that attend the Chicago public schools have opted for remote learning. Those students, those families that have opted to return will be in classrooms on remote learning. And I, and I think we have to paint that picture and clarify that for everyone that's wondering. Our children will not be going back into school environments into a normal space. In fact, they will be going back into a school environment to do exactly what we're doing here right now, to do exactly, quite frankly, what the Board of Education is doing, um, having meetings on Zoom. Um, and so what we are saying very clearly is that you have to prioritize safety, that you have to acknowledge that our school communities have all different sizes, shapes, colors, ages, um, and that all of those people have dignity and deserve safety and protection. Um, beyond that, um, I am ashamed of our city that our leadership continues to back us into a corner to choose to make this choice, which is a false choice. We should be partnering. We should be working together. We should be figuring out how to maximize the safety and, and creating learning opportunities that extend beyond remote learning and reimagining public education. This is our opportunity. Instead of doing that, we have been threatened with termination. If we choose our lives and our households, um, we have been rebuffed at the negotiating table. And that is not how you survive a pandemic together. So I want to appreciate the members of the Chicago Teachers Union who are doing a yeoman's job with turning the impossible into the possible. And I also wanna lift up all the families in the Chicago public schools that are turning the impossible into the, po into the possible. Um, and I think that that is important in this moment. And equity also means listening to black parents, listening to brown parents and prioritizing their safety. Thank you. Maria, did you uh, have something um, to share with the webinar? No, other than, um, hey, you know, the, the, the law is pretty clear. If your workplace isn't safe, you have a right to not go into an unsafe workplace. Um, and uh, arbitrators said CPS buildings are not safe, right? So there's so many indications that they're not safe. We've got members that have been getting sick, uh, workers in the buildings that are contracting COVID. Um, and so they're not safe. And as Stacy and, and, and Jesse had mentioned, what the board is doing is exas exacerbating inequity, right? By sending our teachers who don't even have kids in their classroom into the buildings to work, right? Where you have teachers who all their kids, the parents are saying, I'm not sending my kids in, but yet you're telling teachers to go into the buildings, right? And so uh, look, what the mayor is doing, what CPS is doing is so irresponsible that it's not, it's, it just makes no sense whatsoever. The end of this pandemic is coming. We have the vaccines are rolling out. What is the rush to do this? Let us stay remote. Let our families be safe. Let our students and their families be safe. There is absolutely no reason to do this. Uh, life is not something you can replace. We can, we can have some uh, measures put in to recoup some of this learning loss, right? That could be reversed. We could do that. But the priority as Jesse and Stacy and just about everybody else is going to say should be safety. So thank you everybody for being here. I look forward to a very rich discussion with our nurses and everybody on uh, who are attending. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Maria. Thank you, Jesse. And thank you, Stacy. I appreciate you all. So the first uh, panelist is going to be a nurse um, 
uh, amazing nurse in, in Chicago Public Schools, Jocelyn Hendricks. Um, she is going to be talking about the impact of this virus. We know that we live in a society that is incredibly unequal, that disproportionately affects um, some groups more than others. We know that this virus has decimated the African American community in particular when it comes to deaths in this city. We know that it has disproportionately affected the Latinx community when it comes to infection rates. We know that healthcare in this city is already at a horrible inequity when it comes to uh, providing access to healthcare. We know that in this city, they're talking about shutting down Mercy Hospital on the south side of Chicago during a pandemic, which is a complete outrage. So um, I'll be quiet, I'll let, I'll let Jocelyn uh, give, some, give some words to the panelists, uh, give some words to the webinar. Please go ahead, Jocelyn. Thank you, Dennis. I appreciate that. Um, my name is Jocelyn Hendricks. I have been a nurse for approximately 14 and a half years. Um, my nursing background stems from emergency medicine to psychiatric intensive care. Um, you name it and I've pretty much done it. Um, as Dennis said, as a nurse, I took an oath and my oath is to do what's in the best interest of all that I service, whether that's in a hospital setting or whether that is in the school setting. It makes no difference to me. I'm the type of nurse that has witnessed really bad car accidents and have gotten out of the car to assist in the middle of the street. I keep a little bag sometimes with me in my car and I jump out and I've jumped out on 294 and I've jumped out on 57 and I've jumped out in front of my job before as I watch someone um, almost, well, partially get run over by a car and stabilize him as best I could until the ambulance and other emergency response could get there. So, I feel as if it's my due diligence to ask the parents to ask more questions, to find out information that is not readily being shared with us um, as your, your, your CPS staff, as your nurses. Um, I have encountered on a personal note like others I have had um, three deaths in my family from this uh, from this virus um, my uncle and he uh, he's a veteran um, he was 70s maybe but was still in good health when I tell you that he was gone within 24 hours it's an understatement when I tell you I wasn't allowed, nor was his other six brothers or sisters allowed to go and say their last goodbyes, it was devastating. And being the healthcare representative for the most part for the family, talking with those doctors and them honestly telling me, we don't know what we're gonna do because we've actually, we're, we, we, we're running out of medication to even keep him sedated on the ventilator. Um, you know, we're, we're just hoping that doctors had to make the decision on whether or not they were um, going to, that they are going to, whether or not they're going to make the decision if whether or not they're going to be God and make the decision on whether his life is more valuable than the next. So when it comes to the reopening of the schools, we're just asking for information. We're asking to be a part of the team. We're asking that, hey, let us not be in the Petri dish so that decisions can be made on the life of children, their parents, their grandparents, their great grandparents. These children deserve an education and please believe that we all feel that way. We want them to get the best education that is possible, the safest way though. I think that it needs to be understood that children have been doing remote learning um, since this pandemic uh, started. And they have been in a closed environment within their families and friends and relatives safely. To expose them to a virus and they may be asymptomatic, they might catch it, although the probability of them catching it, as they say, is low. 
the probability of their 70 year old grandparent catching it who has comorbidities of hypertension, diabetes, COPD, congestive heart failure, those probabilities aren't low. Those percentages are actually quite high. And that's the information that's not being provided to the media, to our parents. And the only reason I'm aware of this is like the other nurses is because I went to school for this. I went to school to study and to learn and I, I stay actively trying to learn. I stay active with how COVID, the COVID virus is, is, is changing and there are new strands that are being developed. What also we need to take in consideration is although the rolling rate may be decreasing at this point in time, we're not, they're not looking at the specific areas of our black and brown children that will be returning to the schools. So if we actually look at those areas where those percentages are, they're actually higher than what the rolling rate is right now. Um, some of those have percentages of 13%. Some of them have as high as 22, um, and if not higher. And I didn't look at all of the different areas in um, the city, but just looking at those numbers, those are still high. And that's not safe for even a small community to allow children to come back into an environment that is not necessarily the cleanest, because I understand that we've been, they've, they've informed that they've hired more staff to do cleaning. They've hired more staff to uh, make sure that the ventilation is correct. However, as it's been stated, we've not seen it. The biggest issue that we're facing right now is the lack of knowledge. We're ignorant to everything that is occurring right now um, with the plan to go back to um, into the building. We were not informed. We have not been informed. Um, we have not been informed on what the pods would look like. We have not been informed on uh, the needs of the children. We have not really sure how many children will be returning. From my understanding with talking with some of the teachers, some teachers don't even have students that are returning. So they will be returning to empty classrooms and they will be basically remote teaching from their classroom, um, which does not benefit the students at all or the lives of those teachers that they've asked to return to the school. Um, also for those teachers that do have students that will be returning, they will also be working remotely with those, those students that are still at home. So they will be teaching um, the children that are in person, but then along with remote teaching, which someone is, is, is someone's going to lax a little bit with their, what the material that's presented and what they learn. Um, so what I do ask is that the parents do ask questions, you know, there's no wrong question. There is no stupid question. As we tell our students, as we tell the kids that we service, we're asking that you ask the questions. And because it seems as if they're more forthright with the parents than they are with their staff. And we need that information so that we can service the children to the best of our abilities, as well as to the community and the parents that ask us questions. Um, is, is it going to be safe? Are masks going to be required? Um, is what is the cleaning process? So we're just asking for the support and the help of the parents to help us in making sure that we have the best environment for the children that we are servicing. So thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. I really appreciate um, your words. And again, I also am sorry for your losses. It's um, Tough. It's been tough, uh, and I, and I uh, my, my thoughts are with your, with you and your family. So we let's take a couple questions. Um, if the moderator wants to, I don't know if we're someone's reading them out loud, or if we want to promote someone to to ask them a question live. So, so I've I've got one that I took off of the Q and A. Um, what are the nurses' concerns about care rooms, um, especially with PPE and perhaps a lack of training for people who might be staffing them? And then also kind of a related question, also. Will nurses be provided with any extra training um, since we are now going to be considered COVID nurses? 
Yeah, those are great questions. Um, so does, would, I know that Jocelyn just spoke, I've been speaking a little bit. Uh, I know Erica and Nikisha, you have a couple of comments that are, that are teed up. Does anybody want to take on a couple of those questions and we'll, we'll go to a poll. Nikisha, please go ahead. Hi, um, I'm glad somebody brought up the care rooms because um, again, like Jocelyn said, we have very little knowledge of um, who's going to be um, supervising and caring for these children in a room. We were told from our meetings that we are not responsible at this point and that anyone can be in the care room with these children. So that includes uh, people that have not been trained or non-medical personnel. So again, parents and everybody else that's listening, keep that in mind. Someone that has not been, that's not a nurse, that, that's not a medical assistant, that's not an EMT, can be caring for your child in the sick room, even if they're possibly um, have COVID. So if anybody, and no, we're not getting extra training for that so far. Right. Oh, great. Definitely appreciate that. Let me um, go to is, is uh, the parent from from Vaughn on the line. I apologize. Yeah. So okay, Cynthia, I see you. Go ahead. Uh, so we now we have a, a parent. This is someone who's been uh, whose children child goes to Vaughn uh, High School. They would like to address the webinar. I really appreciate you, uh, Cynthia. I think actually we've talked on the phone before. Now I'm putting a face to the to the name. So it's good to, it's good to see you in person, uh, even if it's remotely. Go ahead, uh, Cynthia. Thank you so much, Dennis. I um, am the uh, parent and um, the, C the chairperson of our local school council at uh, Jackie Vaughn Occupational High School. And I've been a uh, chairperson on the council or since uh, 2014 actually. Um, and we know that our teachers and staff are slated to go back into school this Monday because our entire school is 100% diverse learners, uh, students with disabilities and the uh, cluster uh, programs are um, going back to school on Monday. Well, the teachers and staff are. And uh, we, are, we were really upset that nobody from the CPS has come forward to express any concerns with the numbers um, going up and also with uh, many people traveling. Uh, we understand nobody was forced to stay home uh, during this pandemic or during the holidays, but we do have um, students, um, the majority of the students in our school are um, black and brown uh, students. So uh, over 55% of our students are Latinx. Uh, the next population are uh, African-American students. And uh, we also have a number of students who are uh, unhoused or homeless. And um, we just don't think that it's fair that back in November, our parents, our families were asked if they wanted to send their students back to school. However, they were not given any other information regarding what the pandem pandemic rate might be, the infection rate might be, or they were um, not given the two weeks after the break to remain in remote learning as many of the private schools and the uh, charter schools even sheltered workshops are not allowing their participants to go back into their programs or their students to go back into their programs for at least two weeks after the break. And uh, we waited and waited and we heard nothing from CPS. And therefore yesterday, um, well, we had decided on the 24th of December to hold a special meeting to pass a resolution and what our resolution basically states is that it's unsafe for anybody, any staff, any administration, any administrator, any students to go into the building. And we believe that until our uh, families, our staff, our students and teachers are all brought to the um, 
the table, we are not going to go back into an unsafe building. And um, this is the way to go. You, we're not going to let people go into an unsafe building. The end. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Cynthia. I really appreciate your, your perspective and your advocacy for your school community. Um, we're going to go next to Erica McIntosh. Erica is someone who I've known, an amazing nurse um, who has an important um, story to tell about uh, coronavirus and about her, her thoughts on this. So uh, please welcome Erica, a fellow nurse in, in CPS. Hi, Dennis. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Erica McIntosh. I'm one of the school nurses at CPS. I have been a nurse for over 21 years. Um, I enjoy this field. It has been, it's just been a marvelous career to be in. The knowledge I've earned and learned and experience I've gained from parents, children, it has been marvelous. Um, also, um, I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm a little bit, um, I'm a little bit hurt by this whole situation, our conversation, because I, I'm seeing that one is being put here and the other one is being put there. Yes, I've been black all my life, so I've had to deal with this, but in a state of a pandemic, it really shows me something about our society that really hurts. And as Stacey said, I am also ashamed at the response that is being given that parents and students, and you feel like you're at this place where there's your back is against the wall. Um, I was diagnosed with um, COVID-19 of March of this year. Between the 17th and the 19th, I almost died. Um, liver, kidney, shutting down. My doctors were surprised to see that I made a drastic turnaround. Why it happened, I don't know, but I'm glad to be here, everyone. My primary care doctor said to me that, you know, Erica, there's no COVID bi um, Bible. So there's nothing that we, I mean, we're just applying what we can do by the cases that we have. And that means that to me is that we're just using the best information we have at this present time. So at this point, we need to kind of slow ourselves down and use the best information that we have and be safe. What, what does that being safe means? It means taking the CDC guidelines and taking a look at it and saying, hey, our cases exceed right now what is going on, right? So how, how do we shut down restaurants and say to kids, parents, your wonderful jewels, send them to school in buildings that I, I'm gonna say straight out. Many of my um, schools, when I had eight schools, I'm happy to be in a school, one school this year, so thank you. But many of my schools, I didn't have running water. I didn't have a sanitizing um, agent. I had to buy it myself. And um, it, it just made me wonder about the police people I'm working for. Some of my offices were in the hallway, so privacy was an issue. So the true, the, the, the situation here that we have to deal with, we fought for a nurse in every school. I thank God I'm at one school. However, let's talk about how we apply the CDC guidelines in schools with a, with a virus that is airborne, contact, droplet. And for the nurses sitting here, we know what that means. We know that small spaces, these viruses airborne do a lot of work. When I was in the hospital, when I heard a TB patient, I knew that I was going to a specific room because that's an airborne virus, people. So if CPS is saying they're going to put in this and that, they haven't included me in the discussion. And I am the public health person in the building, and I respect that role, and I am ready. Put my gloves on. Do I have gloves? Do I have water to wash my hands? Do I have an office? Please give me the tools that I need so I can take care of the patients that I have. I can come and give you all these statistics about who's dying or who's living and who black and brown are dying more than white, da, 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 blah. But who wants to say, let's choose this person today, let them die. Who wants to be the parent of the one child out of the minimum that died? I don't want that to be, not for my son and daughter. So I'm not going to ask anybody's child at this point when the numbers are whether they're coming up or going down, let's get them below. Where we need to be. 
What is that gonna hurt us? Hindsight is wisdom. And I have the knowledge, I'm going to use it. So, you know, when I um, was putting together my whole conversation about spacing and, and, um, and being six feet, a minimum, I couldn't find the cubic centimeters in the school that would allow that to happen, people. I just want CPS to know that this is not the time for what you have. Let's give ourselves the time, get the people in order. And we, there's no rush. I don't know. They tell me there's a rush, there's something going on and include me on in the conversation. Then I'll be, oh, but I'm not gonna risk my life. I have comorbidities, you all. And I don't think, I mean, I watched a movie the other day, a dog died and came back as another dog. I don't know if I'm a comeback. So <laughs> right now, I really just want us to think about the children and how special they are to their parents and who they are to us smallest of the littlest one that come in and say, I just thank you for taking care of my cold yesterday. But this, this is a virus. And I want you all to remember something about this virus unlike any other virus. And that's why it's so hard for the public health officials. This virus is transferred even when you're asymptomatic. That's, there's the problem. When you're symptomatic, it's too late. So we're gonna send kids in, let's get vaccinated if that's what you choose to do. Let's make sure everybody is tested before walking in. I haven't heard anybody say that. So right now, I'm just asking for us to get ourselves ready, listen to your members and your parents and give us the time and do the due diligence. I'm not saying you haven't done it, but we are not in her in haste. So with that, I wanna thank you guys for being here and thank you all. And I'm just gonna keep listening, thank you. Thank you, Erica. Really appreciate uh, your message and, and what your the expertise you bring forward. Um, I'm going to let another poll question put forward. Um, so if the, if the moderators could put forward this poll question, um, do you feel safe returning to school under CPS's current plan? So the poll is going to be appearing on the, on the webinar. It's going to ask you if you feel safe to return to school considering CPS's current plan. Um, while people are answering that, let's take another question um, from, from the screeners. Does, uh, can Jim or someone else put forward another question? Yeah, we, we've got a couple of questions, people um, asking about the, the variant strain. Um, if, our, if anybody on our panel has any thoughts on that. And also uh, a couple of questions about um, like some of our members being told that um, they can bring their kids to their school, but then you know, I guess, I guess the general idea of the question is talking about crossing into different pods and things like that. And maybe if anybody could speak to some of those things, so like the variant strain and then crossing pods and what that could mean, what the effects are of that. Got it. Um, would anyone from the panel like to take one or both of those up? Uh, Nikisha, please go ahead. I know we were talking about this last night, Erica, Dennis, and Jocelyn, um, the, of us hearing about the variant strain. And I'm just going off the source of the ABC news that we was watching last night. And the first known case was in Colorado. So it did supposedly hit the United States. Absolutely right. Um, I mean, I think that's that's a great, a great point to bring up is like, we know that it started to come to this country. We know that it's, it's having a devastating effect in, in Europe or in, in the UK in particular. They're talking about shutting schools down there. And so it's just so many things about this don't make any sense. Um, there is a horrible history in this country when it comes to experimenting on people and particularly poor people and people of color. We all know what the Tuskegee experiment was about in this country. And it has caused a horrible mistrust among some communities with medical experts uh, and understandably so. And so some of it's not unreasonable to look at what's happening with reopening schools as a, as a mass experiment being conducted on people in this city. And we know the majority of people who attend public schools in Chicago are African-American, Latinx students, of children of essential workers. And to me, it seems like all this talk about equity, all this talk about they really wanna get people back in classrooms to, to provide equity when it comes to education 
doesn't make sense to me because these are the people who have already suffered so much because of this coronavirus. To, to bring people back into buildings right now is a mistake. And it's, and it's not, I think, accidental that the same groups of people who have been suffering disproportionately have also opted to keep remote learning. And so to me, CPS's plan to try and bring people back into rooms right now, back into school buildings, when you've had people who have already been suffering uh, from this coronavirus, who have seen the effects of it, it just, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense from any, from any standpoint. Um, I'm gonna go to, uh, I know we, had, we have now uh, our, our, our final panelist, uh, Nikisha. Um, also amazing co-worker, amazing nurse in, in Chicago Public Schools. Please, uh, I'd like you to talk about the effects of coronavirus as it has been on children. A lot of the, the news out there, a lot of people, I think this misconceived uh, idea that kids aren't really affected by coronavirus, they're not really um, impacted by it. So please talk more about that. Um, thank you, Dennis. And thank you um, to all the panelists for allowing me to be a part of this discussion, to the parents and for the parents and those who listening. I am not only a nurse, but as Jocelyn as other um, nurses on this panel have said, we are advocates and we choose to be advocates for Chicago's children, for the black, brown community as well as the white community, but uh, especially so the black and brown community because they are the ones that's being devastated by the virus. So I just wanna share some facts with you. I got pages of them, but I'm only gonna be, do a few. So they're saying that this, um, this virus is not really um, affecting children, but yet children are still getting this virus. According to the NBC News, as of November, 2020, over 1 million, in fact, 1,039,464 children were positive of this disease. A statement by Dr. Sally Goza, which is the pediatrician for American Academy of Pediatrics said, as a pediatrician who has practiced medicine for over three decades, I find this number staggering and tragic. We haven't seen a virus flash through our communities in this way since before we had vac vaccines for measles and polio. Um, this is something that I pulled from the CDC. Um, this was of November, 2020, of course, this year. Um, it says race and ethnicity are risk markers for other underlying conditions that affect health, including socioeconomic status, access to healthcare, and exposure to the virus related to occupation. Frontline essential and in critical infra infrastructure workers, which is most of our black and brown communities. Over 75% of the CPS students are black and Latinx. So it's definitely affecting them. Another um, fact that I pulled up, and that this is from American Academy of Pediatrics. 78% of the deaths of children from COVID-19 were Black and Latinx. Um, and this is something that a lot of the people have not been talking about and I, it took some digging for me to find. There is a virus called MIS, which is linked to COVID-19. It's multi, let me get this right, multi-inflammatory syndrome. So we're dealing, like we're talking about variants um, different kind of strains. This is something else that we have to look for in, in our children and it's killing children as well. They're not claiming them as COVID-19 deaths because it is a different disease. So we're dealing with still COVID-19, how to treat the disease. And now we're dealing with something else that is directly affecting our children. Um, like Erica said, it's just, um, it's disheartening that the black and the brown children have to be the sacrificial lambs to, to see what's going to happen. Um, it's gonna take some time even with the vaccinations. Um, President-elect Biden said yesterday that it's gonna take years for people to even get the first dose. And I don't even know if people know that it's gonna take at least two doses of the vaccination of this strand for people to be um, almost not 100% effective, but even for it to like truly uh, hit their system. So this is just things that I want the parents to think about while we're still trying to deal with the issues that 
the CT, the union was asking for and demanding for before the pandemic. And now we're dealing with this situation. We're just asking that some time is taken, some consideration is taken, and that you allow everybody, the nurses, the social workers, the counselors, the building engineers, the, the janit janitors, I'm sorry, to be a part of the plan. That's it. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Nikisha. Your expertise and information is absolutely appreciated. So we have, it's about 549. I think we, we can keep going for another uh, 11, 12 minutes. Uh, I know there's some questions. Can, can uh, someone please put one of the more questions, another question forward? Yeah, I, I, in the one that comes up and it's coming from our, our members who are parents also. Um, and again, it's that question about, um, you know, they're being told that to send their kids to school four days a week with them, basically. So that means that they're gonna be crossing, um, you know, into different pods. Um, so if anybody just had any thoughts on, on, you know, on what that's, what that's going to be like, you know, how unsafe is that things like that? How does it, how does that meet any kind of guidelines that, that CPS is proposing um, when they're saying that there shouldn't be cross pods, right? Jocelyn, I see you have muted. Go ahead, please. So just in speaking about um, that, once again, let me reiterate that I encourage the parents to ask questions because you're asking questions that in all honesty, we don't know. From what we've been informed that the children will not be leaving from their pods. The individuals that will be leaving from them, their pods will be the teachers. Teachers will be moving to different pods as necessary. To my understanding, um, the nurses will be allowed to um, move about the building as needed. Um, that is what we've been informed at this, um, at this point. Um, and I also want to say that you have to understand that the school is going to look different. It's going to be a different environment. So there will be times where there will be, um, whether they're nurses or whether they're whomever they've appointed to cover these care rooms, security officers, um, could be a SICA, could be um, a paraprofessional could be an engineer, could be a janitor. We don't know, okay? And we don't know if they are going to be someone with um, any form of medical knowledge. What I can tell you is it will not be a medical doctor that will be governing and, and monitoring those care rooms. That I can tell you. Um, I do know that, um, and, and also just to let you know, we will be in almost semi-hazmat kind of a gear. So the masking that they've given to the nurses are um, hazmat mat half facial shields with filters on them. Um, that yes, we have went to a special training, um, you know, a refresher, cause uh, like the other nurses have said, we have gone, you know, we've been nurses in other environments. So we have had to train for um, disaster situations just from a hospital standpoint, but they are in 95 mask um, that they do have two filters on the side and they basically stick out and um, not being funny, but it, it almost kind of reminds you of almost like the, the predator, almost the way that you have to sit um, with the mask on, it, it, but a friendlier version. I will say a friendlier version. We will have on face shields. We will have on goggles. We will have, depending on where you're at, we may be in um, gowns and wearing gloves and changing appropriately. Um, so that is to my understanding what we're aware of as of this point where the, what will happen with the different pods. To my understanding, if someone is infected in the pod or someone shows symptoms of being sick, they will be you know, taken to the care room um, and they will also, uh, you know, then they will need to go and get tested for, to determine whether or not it's just a common cold or if it's a COVID virus. Will that entire pod be secluded and isolated? To our understanding at this point in time, no, they will not be. Um, we're not sure how that will even look as far as informing 
parents on there was a suspected case or an illness that was within your pod and so we're asking that you go and get tested or we're asking we're not sure how forthright information will be available to you because of number one there's HIPAA there's FERPA where we have to protect the information of not only the students but also of the teachers of the staff of within the school um, I also did want to comment about the new strand and actually I had looked it up and I was looking at a CNN report um, and they said that the mutation is an unknown or um, unknown and it originated in Southeast England. Um, they said that it, they, they believe is amplified by super spreader events. Okay, so uh, everybody's interpretation of super spreader event is different. So, you know, a super spreader event could be, hey, I get with my immediate family, but then I get maybe, you know, other family that I have not dealt with in maybe, you know, six months. We all want to get together for a family reunion. That could be considered a super spreader event. Or it could be just, hey, we've missed each other. We've missed our students in the school. We've missed them. Although we'll keep it safe, hey, maybe I may have one group of one pod here and another pod all the way across the room just so that they can say hi because they haven't seen their um, friends. So a super spreader event is different in everyone else's eyes. They also say, the last thing is that they said it spreads more quickly due to a higher viral load. And they said that it has a higher propensity to infect children. And that is according to a CNN um, a news article that was just done a few days ago. Um, so what I can tell you is, is that there are a lot of unknowns and a lot of variables. When you're dealing with a virus, just if we think about the influenza, if we think about the flu, the flu is a virus. And as you know, yes, they do have a flu shot that comes out every year that you have the option to take. However, that is last year's strand. It is not the current strand that is going on. So therefore it's a virus and viruses do have a tendency to mutate and change. So we can try to prevent for worse symptoms, but we can't prevent the strand because it's a virus and they change and they have different um, as RNA versus our DNA. So I just wanted to answer that question for everyone. Thank you, Justin. Really appreciate it. Um, I, I know Maria, uh, Marina wanted to jump in. Please go ahead, uh, Maria. Yes, in the question that the, the member posed, um, uh, they had requested uh, some sort of accommodation for childcare and she was denied. And so <laughs> the response she got was, well, send your kid to school, you know, uh, send them into the building. Um, and, and, you know, that is, you know, that is the biggest issue that we have with all our workers in this country where, uh, you know, we have a very huge, uh, wealthiest country in, in the world probably. And, and we're not using the, the resources that we have to make sure that families who can't provide childcare, like if they have to go to work, um, you know, resources so that they can stay at home, right? So that they can take care of their child um, if it's not safe. For families who have lost their jobs, they should have income support, you know, because business have shut down. You know, people are seriously afraid of going to eat in restaurants or coming together and doing uh, shopping because they seem that uh, uh, over a quarter of a million people have died from this. And so I think uh, the, the, the big issue here is that our government has literally failed us, uh, not taking a leadership role in making sure that people had income support, whether they were homeless, whether they were being evicted, they couldn't pay their mortgage, they couldn't pay their rent, they lost their jobs. People are being forced to, to do things that uh, they don't want to because they're going to endanger their lives, right? And so um, th that kind of response from CPS or whoever told that member, well, so then send your kid into the building also, right? Um, and, and so how do we address this? I mean, it, it, it's, yes, yeah, educators, you know, we, we have a very strong, organized, powerful union, right? <laughs> we have been able to push back against the craziness of the board and the mayor uh, and done 
everything we could uh, to not only listen to our members, but to listen to the parents. You know, we've had like meetings with over a thousand parents because they don't trust CPS, they trust us, and they wanna know what they can do to be safe, right? How to advocate for their child's education, but to do it in a way that keeps them safe, right? And so that's what we're saying. Look, this is not safe. We don't trust you, CPS. We don't trust your political agenda, Mayor Lightfoot. Um, and we are not gonna risk our lives when the laws on our side says, if your work environment is not safe, I don't have to go in. When an arbitrator has ruled that those buildings are not safe and people and workers are getting sick in there and they're dying, you don't have to go in there and you don't have to go in those buildings if you believe it's not safe. And so, um, and, and to say, well, just have your kid go in there also, mix pods and, and see what happens. It's so irresponsible and so, so dangerous. Um, and so uh, this, yeah, and so it's, it's compounded by the fact that yes, workers, majority of who are black and Latinx are essential workers, or, or we have immigrants who are working in essential jobs. They're the ones who cannot work remotely, right? Uh, who maybe can't advocate to be remote work, you know, uh, in remote settings. And so, yeah, they're the ones who are getting sick and losing their lives. Uh, and so, uh, and, and yeah, we speak up for our parents who are mostly black and Latinx, working class, low income, and we're fighting. This is, this is not just for us, but we're also fighting for our students and our parents, uh, our students' parents, right? Because now they're getting gypped, right? Hey, so guess what? Uh, your, your kid's remote learning is going to be even worse now because we're forcing the teachers in the building and, and you chose uh, remote learning. And so this is like a double whammy. And uh, yeah, this, this is, uh, this is uh, as Stacey said it, uh, like it's, a, it's shameful. It's a shameful situation. Um, and uh, we shouldn't stand for it and, and we're not in, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very dangerous and thank you. All right, I wanna appreciate people's time. It's, it's six o'clock now. And I, and I think that it's, we've got to put a, we've put a clear message out there to everybody about what we think in regards to restarting um, in-person learning. We don't think it's safe. And one thing that we should remember, like coming out of all this uh, pandemic for the past several months, it has been regular people like ourselves who have stood up to fight to make our communities more safe. When you look at the protests that have taken place to keep hospitals open on the South side, it's been regular working people who've been standing up and demanding that workplace, that uh, hospitals and healthcare be provided on the South side. When you look at workplaces like Amazon, it's been Amazon workers themselves standing up and demanding the kind of PPE. I've seen the same thing in hospitals where nurses have been protesting, demanding safe PPE for them. It's been regular people. So people should take from this the need to stand up, organize in your LSC, put statements out saying that uh, what you think about the, the attempt to restart in-person learning. If you are a member of the of Chicago Teachers Union, you should sign the all member pledge letter, um, putting forward your beliefs about what you think in regards to schools being, being started. Work with uh, your local elected officials, talk to them, talk to your alder person, talk to your uh, Cook County commissioner, talk to your congressperson, your state rep about what you think in regards to this. We need to speak out and, and push uh, to keep our schools uh, remote, uh, improve remote learning. It seems to be it would be an incredible mess to try and have, pe have people go into buildings right now and teachers teaching remotely at the same time as teaching people in person all the while increasing the chances for people to contract this disease. I can only imagine the horrible feeling that a student would feel if they had caught coronavirus in a school, brought it home, and a grandparent or loved one uh, uh, got sick and, 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 and then the worst outcome could pass away from this, from this horrible pandemic. Um, we don't, it's not even worth that happening to one person, in my opinion. So I know there's a, a final poll that we wanted to put forward. Um, it's, uh, will you resist a return to school buildings um, and uh, demand that CPS negotiate with the CTU and other stakeholders for an agreed upon safe return? So please, please answer that poll. Um, and, were there any, any final comments? 
um, from the panelists. Right now, Jim, you just unmuted. Did you something something you wanted to, to say? Yeah, just we dropped some link into the chat um, where you know our members can find the letter to uh, to send, and um, some links for others um, who are non-members who can well even our members too. You can contact our elected officials um, to talk about some of this. It's awesome. All right. So if would anyone like to make any any closing um, comments from the from the panel, uh, Eric, I saw you unmuted. Did you want to go ahead? I'd like to say something, everybody. I noticed something when talking to my other, um, the colleagues um, at CPS, at UIC, and my school buddies um, from nursing school, we're all concerned. And you know what, I'm gonna say something. Last year around this time, we all knew as medical professionals, something was happening. We all knew when we were in hospital, something was just, patients are, this I like feel in the hospital. So as I'm talking, as um, Nikisha was talking, as well as Jocelyn about this new, um, strain. We have an opportunity to look back and do something about the future. It's it's so I'm sitting here listening to this. Last year, I had a school with on almost 500 students out in January. So we knew something was happening. So why are we waiting now? And um, as Maria said, our administration has failed us. I don't want to lose another student. So I'm just kind of looking at this and thinking, oh, here we go again. So that's all I was thinking I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Well, I think on that note, um, seeing, seeing no other uh, people who want to put forward a statement, I really want to thank, again, everybody. I uh, appreciate your um, time to come and participate in this uh, forum. I hope that it was useful. There was some information that maybe people learned about it, and I hope it gave you some underlying understanding as to why it is that we have to continue to keep schools remote, why we have to do this on behalf of our students that it, and our communities, um, that it is we who keep us safe. It is we who stand up and fight for the safety of our schools. The Chicago Teachers Union has a long and proud track record. It was the Chicago Teachers Union who struck for 11 days a year ago, and one of the main demands was a nurse in every school every day. We take this very seriously. We don't put this forward lightly. We wish we could be in buildings. We wish it was safe to be in buildings, but right now it is not. You have some zip codes with 17% positivity. The Belmont Craigan neighborhood has a 17% positivity rate. It is not safe for us to return in buildings. It is not worth anyone's life. So again, thank you so much. Stay safe. Uh, we wish you all a happy new year and um, we will keep keep this struggle going. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. Solidarity. Nice job, everybody.